Okay, right. Welcome to week three, and today we're going to have a little bit of a look at report writing and structuring a formal report, which is what you're going to be producing. And we'll be set up there, we'll be looking at individually uh, tomorrow in the workshops um, some of the principles that I'm going to talk about uh, today. I knew there was a good reason for using Firefox all the time. It behaves much better than IE or uh, Chrome for opening things. So, structuring and writing a report. And what I want to briefly cover today, and we'll finish when we finish, is three things that we need to think about when we get a question that leads to a formal report. One is how we think about the sort of structure that communicates our ideas really effectively. But to do that, we first of all have to actually work out what the question actually means. And one of the things that you'll discover when you start uh, in your placement year in a couple of years' time is that your bosses may not actually give you a clear question. Or they may give you a surface level question that it looks apparently ever so, ever so easy to answer. But the answer you get is trivial and not actually terribly helpful to anybody. And what you really need to be thinking about is what's underneath the question. And I remember back in my years at Rolls-Royce Aerospace, there were many times when my bosses asked me to do a particular task and didn't bother to give me any context. And I needed to go back to them to really dig into their thinking so that I could answer the question they really had at the back of their mind. So I could do appropriate modeling, data collection, analyses, etc., 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 and then tell the right story to them so they could make an informed, <coughs> sensible, valuable decision. And as you're doing that, one of the things that you need to be thinking about are the terms that they are using. And I remember one occasion where my boss with a completely different background all his life within Rolls-Royce Aerospace and I with my same length of experience pretty much in Rolls-Royce Aerospace, we use one or two words in very, very different contexts and for a while, I think it was about 35-40 minutes, we made absolutely no progress whatsoever in understanding what the question was really about. And suddenly I realized that we were using one word only with two different meanings. So I just had the flexibility to say, okay, right, I'm going to use your uh, uh, meaning, and that means then we made progress. And in five minutes, I was out of the door, able to start working on the problem. So there's several things involved in understanding the question at its deeper levels. First of all, to think of the meanings of the words. Do we actually mean the same thing? And this is really very, very important when you start thinking about the problem that you're going to select to write your article over the next few weeks. 
So it's always very, very worthwhile when you start thinking about writing a report like you're going to be doing, you start thinking about definitions of some of the critical terms. Because if you can then lay them out carefully in your context or introduction section, then everybody is then clear about what you're talking about. And then thirdly, I want to look at the question of writing a report to convince your listener or your reader. Most of what you are going to be doing is not descriptive. This is how things are. <coughs> You are going to be leading from the, yeah, here's a bit of description about how things are, how things have changed. But the more important point is, so answering, so what? What does it mean? Why does it mean that? <coughs> what is the impact of that change? Most people really couldn't care less about the straight description. We are so pressurised these days with so many sources of information. All those social media postings that keep pouring through our smart devices. All of the other websites that we have subscriptions to. And we get lots and lots and lots of emails every day with new information. And we cannot cope with all of it just being descriptive. We need to know very clearly. <coughs> so what? What's the impact on me? What's the impact on my company? What's the impact on university? What's the impact on my course? What's the impact on us in general? <coughs> we don't have the luxury of reading tens or hundreds of thousands of words a day. We just don't have time. So we need to think of ways of capturing our readers' attention <coughs> and making them think, ah, I'm going to learn something and it's worthwhile my time and there's something at the end of it that's valuable for me. Something I can make a decision on, perhaps. Something I can do usefully. <coughs> so those are the three objectives today. So, a couple of things. What's the context? And what's your title going to be? Because the first thing that's important to your reader, the first thing that's going to grab their attention, is the title. Now think about the research that you may already have started doing in relation to your assignment, that article you're doing for week eight. <coughs> you will often probably have started using Google or Bing or some of the other search engines and putting in some keywords. And as you get your results coming back, uh, Google tries to do a little bit of help for you to actually uh, sequence the results that it provides on the first page and the second, the third, and the fourth, and the millionth page. It tries to make them as relevant as it can to what it thinks you're looking for. If you are using, say, a uh, Google search engine and you are signed in with your Gmail account or whatever other account works with Gmail or with Google, it will be building up an enormous uh, database of the searches that you have actually put <coughs> to it over the past however long and it will be trying to set and guess what you want out of your searches. And as you look at those results, you are going to be looking at the titles, aren't you? That's the first thing you do, is to look at the titles of the web pages and the PDFs and so on that the search engine is bringing back to you. And if they're obviously irrelevant, you ignore them and go down to the next one or the next one or the next one. And so when you are writing your reports and your articles, the first thing you need to think about is what is going to be the title that I put at the top of my assignment or my article. 
Now, there's two reasons for thinking about it at the beginning. One is that it helps you to maintain focus while you're doing your research. Now, the other thing about it is you might well come back to the title after you finish writing the article and just before you submit it to wherever you're going to submit it, whether it's to turn it in for academic submission or whether it's for you submitting it to some other publication or your blog or your LinkedIn page or wherever you're going to put it, you need to do a, a sort of sanity check. Does the title really capture very concisely what the whole article or the whole report is actually about? So first off, it gives you a focus for your research, your analysis, and your structuring of your report. And then at the end, you come back and check it to make sure that it's still relevant to what you've actually got in that body of your report and is going to catch the attention <coughs> of those readers you really, really, really want to read that article. So think about the title. <coughs> now one of the things I want you to do tomorrow in the workshop, and we'll be going through many of the steps here again tomorrow, actually online doing research to get answers to these sort of questions. <coughs> and what I want you to do tomorrow is to go onto Google Scholar and places like that, or university websites, and try to find some really good sources of information, <coughs> advice, about how to structure reports. You'll find advice for structuring <coughs> reports, advice for structuring essays, and, and, and. And I want you to think about reports, business type reports, formal reports. And I'll summarize a little bit some of the things you might discover. First of all, you look at the assignment specification that's set for you, whether by me or Wayne or all of the other lecturers you have over your next three years actually here in class. And we will give you, often, some advice. Sometimes we won't. We'll just say, I want a formal report. Sometimes, you'll get a bit more structure as you do in the assignment for this article on this module. <coughs> but there will always be at least three sections which you must have. An introduction, a conclusion, and a bibliography or list of references. We'll look at each of the sections um, shortly. And then somewhere in it, between the introduction and the conclusion, you're going to find a whole series of extra sections which you need to put in there to help lead the, your reader through the stages <coughs> of your argument. So, sometimes you'll be given those sections and to this, this semester, this half, ter, half semester, because you're starting here in the university, I've given you some fairly clear sections that you need to think about. And partly in this module, it's important that you follow those sections that are given you as advice because they link very, very closely to the assessment criteria that we looked at in the workshop last week. So there's several things that are going to give you clues to what those sections are. Now sometimes if you aren't given those sections, you will need to think about them as you do your research and your analysis and planning of your assignment. So you've, you start off with the first bit that starts the reader on their journey. It might be some definitions. It might be the broader picture. And then from that you lead into a narrower picture, a narrow, narrower analysis of some of the really important things that your research has drawn, drawn to your attention as being important for your particular analysis. <coughs> your friend sitting next to you with a different background, a different set of research, may come up with a different set of ideas to plan that route through from beginning to end. And that's important. 
neither of you are wrong. You are building different stories that reflect your different research and your different thinking, back, uh, th thinking processes based on your background. We'll come back to this aspect of your background and how that affects the way that we indiv are individuals and look at things individually a bit later on in the semester. But remember, we all look at things differently and that difference or those differences, those many, many, many perspectives are incredibly important in the way that we generate new ideas for the future. <coughs> so, quick summary. First question for you, what are going to be your important questions as you look at one of those four topics and try to work out something that is uniquely different from everybody else around you? Wayne and I want to see 210 <coughs> different assignments, 210 different articles which look at those four topic areas from 210 odd different perspectives. We don't want to get bored witless by having 30 or 40 articles which all <coughs> appear to look at the same thing in the same way and come to the same conclusions. It makes our life exceptionally tedious. <coughs> so it's my challenge, our challenge to you, to come up with something different. Each one of you. It shouldn't actually be different, because they're very broad topics. Each one of them is very, very broad, and there's four of them, so it shouldn't be too difficult. So start with those questions. We'll investigate them tomorrow in the groups. We'll have sessions, so the starter will probably be some broad <laughs> principles relating to the topics, some broad questions, and then see how those map into the other sections that are specified in the assignment. So the first, once you've done that little bit of research about good advice for structuring a report, you're going to dive straight into researching those questions. <coughs> Using the sort of guidelines I was talking about last week about those 95% bands on the right hand side of the rubric. How to get really, really spectacularly interesting and valuable content and analysis. Thinking about novelty, thinking about all those other things that affect society. Do you remember that was a really important differentiator from the lower levels of the, of the right hand column? <coughs> How much do these changes really have an effect not just on me, <coughs> but on the way that society actually operates? We thought a little bit about postings on Facebook last week. You know, those photos of me, of us in the, uh, on a Friday night and the, the adverse consequences of that. And we also looked at a bit of the <coughs> positive conf, um, consequences of a good uh, social uh, presence. But if you think about Twitter, think how things have changed in the political environment over the last 10 years. If you think about what happened in the American elections <coughs> three, two, three years ago, Obama and his sort of uh, publicity machine used Twitter and, and social networks to incredible advantage. And if you look at what happened only three weeks ago with the elections for the leader or the leadership of the, the Labour Party in the UK, Jeremy Corbyn and his group of advisors were spectacularly successful in getting social media and Twitter on their side. And what's happened? 150 odd thousand new members of the Labour Party and an enormous land um, or swell of uh, popular acclaim that allowed him to be elected, even though most of the pundits said he hadn't the faintest chance of winning that election. And yet, he won spectacularly. He could have done it without Twitter, without Facebook. The world has changed. And that's just one example um, I wanted to bring out to you this week. 
of how these technologies are fundamentally changing things. So you use your title, the broad title of the individual section. You then think about the sort of title that you want to concentrate on, having thought about, is that actually affecting the way society is working now? Or maybe in another two or three years, you can find evidence that shows that that's going to have a big impact <coughs> on the way things happen. You then need to do a little bit of thinking about where to go and search. Are you going to go inside the academic journal libraries, Science Direct, ACM Digital, and so on and so forth? Or maybe some of the social science type of uh, web, um, journal, journals we have, we've got access to through the library. Are we going to use Google Scholar? Quite a good thing. Now, I, my advice would be, if you're going to use Google Scholar, make sure that in that same browser, um, you've also got your UDO um, login, so that you can then pick up easily the um, Google Scholar articles in full text. Because if you are already logged in to UDO, as a University of Derby student, you will often find that Google Scholar, rather than just giving you the abstract, will launch you straight into the full text of that article. Makes life a lot easier for you. Because you really don't want to be working just from the abstract as you actually start writing and planning your work. You need to have the whole article, not the abstract. The abstract's great for your initial work. So you might want to start off in the social sciences type of area that look at some of these changes because you'll probably find more journal articles in social sciences about these changes, the social media effects um, and, so, and things like that area than you will do in our computer sciences type of article, uh, journals. <coughs> but as I say, you can shortcut that to some extent by using Google Scholar. Once you've done that, then you start thinking about the keywords that are going to be important and, the, the, in general terms, the search terms that you are going to use. And it doesn't hurt to actually write down or type out a few sets of criteria that you're going to use as your search terms as you then start your research. And you know what happens when you put searches into search engines, you get tens hundreds, thousands, millions of responses. And you've got to think carefully about how you use those results sensibly to get a reasonable range of perspectives that you can then use as you develop the analysis of your, your article. But while you're finding all these sources, if they're PDFs, make sure you download them onto your memory stick or wherever. If they are web pages, make sure you turn those into PDFs. Use something like Qt PDF um, or one of the other printed drivers which you can install on your PC that just create a nice PDF from the web page. Store that away. Don't lose them. They're important. They're valuable. Because you may not be able to find them again. One of the problems about the modern uh, approach to information search, and this was written about by a guy called uh, Nicholas Carr uh, around about five, six years ago in a book called The Shallows, or How the Internet is Changing the Way We Think. One of the problems we have nowadays is we know we can probably find the source again. We don't have to remember it, because I can probably find it, but only if you've got the same search terms as you used last time. So, store them away. It's always useful to build up your resources folder. Have a folder on your memory stick. Think about the structure that you'll need in terms of the subfolders so you can store all sorts of sources relating to your different assignments, your different modules, and so on. And also, as you download, don't download five items and think, ah, I haven't done my working bibliography. Have a Word document open, your working bibliography for this module, <coughs> and put down in there 
for each of those five sources, you've just found the full Harvard Standard um, reference. Starting, obviously, with the surname of the lead author, initials, and so on, year of publication, title of the article, title of the web page, etc., etc. And that's why I've been pushing Plato at you these last two weeks, because Plato tells you how to build your working bibliography to Harvard Standard. And the nice thing about doing the Harvard Standard at the time you build your biblio working bibliography is it's ready to be copied and pasted into your article, into your report. If you don't do that, you're going to find you've got to the end of your article, you've got about 10 minutes to submit it, and you suddenly realise that half of your citations don't have references at the back of your article, and that's kind of a problem. You will lose marks hand over fist if you haven't got all of those citations properly referenced in the bibliography. So do it ahead of time, because we're all alike, me, you guys, we tend to do things at the last moment, and if you've forgotten to do the citing and referencing, you've got ten minutes, and that's really a big problem. So build a working bibliography for each module or each assignment, and that's then useful for copying and pasting into your article as you write it. <coughs> it also means that you've then got a repository of all of the research you've done in your academic <coughs> career, module by module, year by year. So that when you come to do some of these sort of capstone projects at the end of the um, your <coughs> career here in your third year, you have a phenomenal resource that you can go to quite quickly to avoid having to re-search for lots and lots of articles and information. You'll still want to do some more because you know it's three years later, so time has moved on, newer sources are available. But there's a lot of stuff that you capture now that will be useful in the future. So build that working bibliography, it's incredibly important and valuable. <coughs> so the next thing you do, you've done lots and lots and lots of research. You've got a really great working bibliography. You've probably written quite a lot of notes about what your sources have got to say that help you build a really great understanding in your head. Up to this point, you won't have done any real substantive writing for your article. You do not read a bit, write a bit, read a bit, write a bit, otherwise you end up with that disastrous sort of drunken spider's walk structure to your, to your writing. And that's impossible for anybody to read. They don't know where you've come from, where you're going to, and to you even it's a surprise when you get there. Typically, the place you get to is where you run out of words because you've come to the end of your three pages. No, you start differently. You've done your research, you've got all these ideas, lots and lots of different perspectives, and then you start developing your structure. Now, I really don't care how you do it. For some people, Working on a, with a pen and pe uh, pencil and paper is great. For some people, there's some software on our machines in the lab and down in the library uh, called Mind Map or Mind Genius, which cr creates what are, uh, what are called mind maps. You could do it in Word, building the structure of each of the sections between the introduction and the conclusion, head of one. Introduction, header two, header one, the next section, header one, the section after that, and so on. With some subsections at header two level, and possibly even a few for longer work, longer assignments, header three level sub subsections. Sub <coughs> subsections. Now the nice thing working down to header three level, sub subsections, is when you start writing, you've only got a couple of paragraphs to fit in there. One of the biggest problems that we all ha have when we're writing an article, a report, or whatever, is writer's block. We've got this empty blank page <coughs> in Word, or whatever we're using to write. 
And we can sit there staring at the screen thinking, I wonder where to start. <coughs> and you hear famous authors saying how sometimes they have a big problem, they don't know where they're starting, where their book's going to go. And for days and days and days, nothing happens. But if you start building a structure, you think, got your introduction and one or two ideas in there. You then got the next chapter, which comes logically from your research, setting out the starting point. You've probably got the end point that you want to get to, because you've done all this thinking, you've got in here a lot of information, You've made your, decided what you're trying to prove or what's going to happen as a conclusion and that can be down in the conclusion. Then you've just got to lay out two or three steps. Se section one, section two, section three. And that is going to allow you to start writing nice and easily. And if you've got sections, what, the sections, <coughs> subsections, sub subsections, <coughs> all carefully laid out, that allows you to then think about the logic the logical flow of what you're doing. And you can move those headers around a little bit, or the subsections around, without any text there, just to make sure that you've got a really sensible, clear way of communicating what the problem's about, some of the critical issues around the problem, how different ideas contribute to developing your justified conclusion. So developing that structure is enormously important. And once you've got it, then of course, you can start writing. And it will actually fl those words will flow off your fingertips. Because it's all in here, because you've remembered what you've written in your notes, you've thought about your notes, you've thought about your sources, you've thought about the logic, you've thought about the structure, <coughs> and suddenly it just becomes ever so, ever so easy to write and write and write flat out. In principle, if you were to wait until the end of week six to have done all of that structuring, and you set aside, you've got what, about 1,500 words maximum. If you set as, in principle, were to set aside two or three full days, you could write, once you've got the structure, all those sub sub headings. It's, you could easily write the whole of the article in two days, flat. Now, I don't actually advocate that you do that. I want you to start a little bit earlier than that, so that you can then review what you've written. And it's actually quite good practice. If you set aside a couple of hours each, each night to write an assignment, or each day, the first ten minutes, if you use the first ten minutes of your two hours, to review what you've already written, proofread it, check the spelling, check the grammar, spec, check the syntax, and so on. And then think about, does that what I've written in that section there really work best there, or should I move it a bit later, or a bit earlier? And spend 10 to 15 minutes sorting out how to make it even more powerful, even more convincing. There you have, oh, and you probably will find on my assignments, the assessment grid that you're using, I want you to use that, A, to drive the quality <coughs> of your writing to the very highest level you can get to, and also, <coughs> before you submit that article to, to turn it in, I would, would very much like you, or very much encourage you, to actually assess your score in each of the columns. How good? Have you really got 100% in the presentation column, or is it actually only 80% or... And then to work out what bits you haven't done right, and correcting those. And then in the other two columns, again, marking yourself out of 100%, based on the criteria in the boxes below, work out what you think is a justifiable score for each of those two columns. One of the reasons for doing that is to help you get the really, really, really best report you're capable of writing. And the second is to get you used to the way 
that your work is going to be marked in all of your other assignments. So that you can actually predict your score ahead of the formal marking that we undertake at the end of the term or whenever. By the time you get to your final year, in fact by the time you get to the middle of next year, you will be so familiar with the assessment criteria that you will be able to predict your, your grade pretty accurately. So that there will be no need for you to feel surprised under most circumstances when you get your grade back uh, in the fullness of time after the two, three weeks when we actually do the marking. Now, this is also really important once you get out of university. You need to be able to assess the quality of your own work in your work environment. Because you're going to be pushed hard at work to deliver a lot of work to a really high quality. And I'd like you to get used to doing that as soon here as possible, where the consequences of getting it wrong aren't quite so bad as they could be at a place of work. You really, I mean, how many of you know what a P45 is? <coughs> Everybody or not? <coughs> a few of you know the P45. P45 is a piece of paper that you get <coughs> when you leave your job. <coughs> it's a piece of paper that you may get rather unexpectedly if you've done a very bad job and you're being sacked. Now, I don't want you, when you get out of here, to be in a position where you end up, because your employability skills are not very good, you collect P45s like sort of a, like confetti. I want you to be able to keep your jobs and do a study of a good job and be successful. And so learning to assess the quality of your own work in the context where you're doing this work is really a very, very important employability skill. So that's kind of what you're going to get. Title section, that's the front page. And for the article you're writing, it'll have the title, who you are, where you come from, your name, your, um, your email address, and so on, table of contents. And then you'll have abstract, which isn't mentioned here yet, we'll talk about that at some stage, introduction, your three or four sections which relate to your analysis of the situation, development of what, what the change is, why it affects society, and then lead into the conclusion, which is just a short summary of the key points that you've evaluated in the rest of the article and the bibliography. <coughs> We go back again to thinking about each of the main sections, those sections between the introduction and the conclusion. And it's the same set of questions. <coughs> Have I got any, any clues from the assignment specification or from the report specification? You know, if, if I'm doing an article, or Tommy or whoever <coughs> is doing an article for a journal, we will often be given some clues as to the, the sections that we must provide, like the introduction with some sort of context, <coughs> a short literature review, existing knowledge, current practices, and then we'll be given some freedom <coughs> later on. So what does the assignment spec, the report spec, say about what you need to have? <coughs> You need to add to that all of you, the, what you've learned from doing your research. So in this assignment, for this article, you're given effectively a cl fairly clear understanding of what sort of titles you need for, um, for some of the sections, but you will then need to think a bit more about, do I leave it exactly as written, or should I change it to reflect the impact of that specification on my particular topic, the particular context that I'm writing for. And then, you know, all of those articles, all of those sources that you've been researching, that you've found, how does that knowledge help you to develop the substructure of those sections? 
The introduction, very, very important. <coughs> You're trying to capture your reader's interest. So you need to make your statements very clear about the context and about what you're trying to do. You want to make it interesting. You don't want to send your reader to sleep in that first few sentences. You've got to keep them awake, you've got to make them wake up. And think, ah, I've really got to read to the end of this, this is really fascinating. So, Coming at the topic from an unusual perspective might be valuable. That'll wake them up pretty much. <coughs> unusual, different perspectives. Things that they're not expecting to see. Now it shouldn't be too difficult because those four topic areas that you've got are not things that most people in a big wide world are really thinking about very much, other than perhaps the social media <coughs> question. Those other three ones, there's fewer people thinking about it. And if, uh, if it is the fraud cybercrime where maybe there's quite a lot being published in the, in the popular press, well come at it from a different perspective. Find some really interesting stories that really make the point. What you've got to think about, however, is your message. Why is it different? What are you wanting to tell people? But to do that, you really need to think very uh, carefully about developing a linear, logical sequence of ideas. A linear structure. Because what people do not really like to have is a whole set of parallel starting points and they kind of lose a thread from point one, point two, point three until you draw them together at point four. And that kind of causes problems. So you've got to have a continuous developing uh, uh, sequence, a logical structure. Remember that in all of the work you are doing, both here in the university, and when you get out into the big wide world, we're looking for analysis. It is very, very rare that anybody wants a whole set of description. Lots and lots of facts. So what? Why should I care, the reader will say, about these facts. And it's your job at all times to do the thinking and then tell the reader the story of what those facts mean. How accurate are they perhaps? <clears throat> because if we look at the world of big data, the Internet of Things, that many of us are going to get involved with in one way or another over the next five years or so. We have a problem of veracity. 80% of all the big data that's out there is of questionable veracity. Not that it's all wrong, but we have no way of detecting easily which bits of data, which bits of information are correct, or which bits of information are inc incorrect, or by how much they are incorrect. So you've got to do that analysis of your sources, try to work out the veracity or the principles which will help us to understand which bits of data we can rely on, which bits of information we can rely on, not just with the IoT and big data, but also all of those sources that we use, whether they're internet sources of text or the journal articles. Every year or three, there are some minor scandals within the academic community about the fact that not all of the peer reviewing process for journal articles is terribly effective. So even when you are picking up lots of journal articles, 
you need to remember that your analysis has to include the veracity of those sources. So, a critical analysis, compare and contrast, both of the quality of the data you're using, the information you're using, and of those sources. And then you've got to think about how good your logic is in terms of what you're doing, the or how you're doing the analysis, and you've got to think about the evidence. And of course, you show where your evidence is with citations, with bibliography references as well. And you think about that for each of your chapters, you use the same sort of analysis as you build that plan of your structure. And then that final bit, you finally get to the end point. Your analysis in sections, or the introduction plus those, ne those next few major sections <coughs> leading up to the conclusion is how you lead your reader through that sequence of logic and justification and evidence that this is my point that's really important. And then, because you know, humans don't have fantastically good memories by and large, the conclusion section is fairly short, <coughs> and you use it to remind your reader of the most important points that you have covered during your analysis. So that, in principle, if your reader misses out all of the analytical chapters, just reads that introduction <coughs> and the conclusion, they understand where you've come from and how you've got there. So the and when you get to help <coughs> into the into work sort of environment, <coughs> You know, you may have slaved away for weeks or months on a big report, 20, 30, 40, 50 pages or more. Your direct boss, your supervisor, may, for the first few times that you produce a report like that, may well go through the whole thing. But once you have earned their respect and they have trust the credibility of the work you do, they will probably read the introduction and then turn to that conclusion. And then they'll make their decision on that conclusion. The senior level bosses don't have the time to read the body, they just look at the, the uh, introduction and the conclusion. Many a time when I was at Rolls Royce, and those of you who actually work in, uh, have had some work, uh, proper jobs for years, you, know, you will know that bosses or managers request memos, emails of no more than three quarters of a page. You have to condense the whole of weeks and weeks and weeks worth of work into less than a page. Otherwise it won't get read. Nothing will happen with it. So you have to think about how big your introduction is and how big your conclusion is so that you can capture people's attention in probably two or three minutes. <coughs> <coughs> in terms of structure, your bibliography is properly formatted to Harvard standards. It contains, must contain all of the sources that you have used and only the sources that you have used. Under most circumstances in the School of Computing and Maths, you will not be asked for a reading list. There may be one or perhaps two modules over the next three years where for very specific reasons a lecturer will ask you to provide a reading list as well as a list of cited items. But under most circumstances, the reading list, by the way, I looked at this 50 set of sources but I haven't used them, is of no interest to anybody. You are not writing a textbook where the reading list is kind of helpful to provide you, know, you guys or us as a list of extra sources which might be of interest to you. 
your bibliography for this article and most of the reports you're going to write in your next three years are a list of the sources that you have actually cited in your written text. And of course they must be sorted into alphabetical order. <coughs> now, some, sometimes you might still have a number in front of it, but that will be in terms of a numbered list type of thing, rather than the sequence in which they're cited. The citation, the references must be in the sequence of the alphabetical order of the lead author in each source. Formatting, the presentation side, the use of templates and so on. If there are instructions, follow them. You won't get many marks if you ignore the uh, formatting instructions. Okay, guys, we'll s that's it. I'll see you all tomorrow, hopefully, in your proper sessions. And bring me the, the clicker, please. Thank you.